Oops. <laughs> These are going too fast. There, you got to see a couple extra slides ahead of time. <laughs> where, where is that uh, going to be? The convention center in Toronto. So it's like over right, right. wherever, you know, uh, whatever the address of that is. But anyway, over Front, not, Street. Front Street. It's not far from here. Um, so the Spanish Inquisition is our topic for tonight. And actually, um, what this is going to have ended up being, uh, after I've done a lot of preparation and put, was putting together all the slides and everything like that, is I'm going to say this is more, if anything, the context of the Spanish Inquisition, <laughs> rather than a nuts and bolts of everything about how the Inquisition is really, really working, but kind of understanding the whole background of it. This, um, uh, the idea of this particular lecture, this grew out of one that we did a little over a year ago. Um, we did a lecture on the medieval Inquisition. Uh, which is, as a medievalist, is something that I know a lot more about uh, and had, was kind of presenting on that because we had had a movie night where um, we watched the movie The Name of the Rose together, which is a movie adaptation of my favorite novel, the, which is also the same name, Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose. Uh, and so in that, uh, there's a, a major theme is the medieval inquisition. And so we did a lecture and we talked about um, essentially this transition that happened in the European Middle Ages, uh, what's sometimes called the formation of a persecuting society, where um, the ideas of the other and creating a boundaries of your society and saying, this is who we are and you are not who we are. <laughs> in other words, us versus them, us, you know, us versus you, and other ways like that. So how that sort of um, you know, evolved and one of the, how the Inquisition fits into that. Um, at the same time that we've had that, we've had several lectures, for example, on the Crusades. Uh, and in that sense, those are another one of those manifestations of, of diff making a boundary line between uh, an in-group and an out-group. So Spanish Inquisition much is, is going to be, oh, anyway, so people at the end of that one were like, I thought we were going to talk about the Spanish Inquisition, <laughs> which it has nothing to, it was, it ultimately has almost nothing to do with the Spanish Inquisition, which is an early modern um, iteration of the institution of the Inquisition as opposed to the medieval one. So no one expects the Spanish Inquisition as the <laughs> uh, famous part in the pop culture. And so, um, you know, I don't know. Chief weapon is surprise, surprise and fear, fear and surprise are two weapons, are fear and surprise, and ruthless efficiency are three weapons, are fear, surprise and ruthless efficiency, and an almost fanatical devotion to the Pope, our four, no, amongst our weapons, <laughs> you know, amongst our weaponry, are such elements as fear, surprise, there we are. So, this is from the Flying Circus. So it's from their TV show, Monty Python. Um, and so as we have in terms of this popular shorthand then, what we can get out of the Inquisition, obviously they're dressed as cardinals. Uh, and of course, they're known for torture, right? And so they have such horrible elements as the rack, uh, the soft cushions, <laughs> and of course, the dreaded comfy chair. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least in the skit, right? And, uh, and this has nothing to do with anything, but I thought I found these images and I thought them so cute that I had to <laughs> put those slides. Essentially, no one expects the Lego Inquisition. So anyway, so this is uh, entered into certainly into the popular culture. People have an, a, uh, a sense of it. The idea of that skit is right in front of when the Inquisition bursts in and starts saying that every single time. Um, uh, a, per a person has made like a statement, well, I didn't expect to, you know, a, Span a sort of Spanish Inquisition. In other words, they didn't expect to be grilled for information or something like that. And then they say, no one expects it, right? Another one of these that I remember from growing up in childhood is History of the World Part One. There is a musical number uh, that Mel Brooks sings. And I just remembered even this particular one line out of it, the Inquisition, let's begin the Inquisition, look out, send our whole, we have a mission to convert the Jews, right? <laughs> and so essentially that's the, uh, and so again, he's dressed in red for a cardinal and then they're busily torturing Jews in this case, <laughs> in, that, in this particular movie, History of the World Part One. Okay, so essentially then in terms of these kind of shorthands, if we'd only seen those particular kind of comedy movies or maybe some other similar things. We have this idea, fear, surprise, fanatical devotion to the Pope, torture, and a mission to forcibly convert Jews, presumably to Catholic Christianity. It's kind of the idea, right? So um, in terms of this thing, this one component here, a fanatical devotion to the Pope, 
Um, the Spanish Inquisition, unlike the earlier medieval uh, Inquisition that we talked about, which is directly subject to the Pope, in this case is an interesting um, new variety in that it actually is under uh, royal and not papal control. So after the Pope's essentially signed up the foundational charter for this and let the get-go. Uh, the kings of, uh, the Catholic kings of Spain, essentially Ferdinand and Isabella, the kings are made into um, the uh, head of the Inquisition. And so it in fact is, is opposed to being something that is um, um, part of the medieval um, capacity of the papacy to exert its influence, let's say, very directly down to the local level, which was really what the medieval inquisition was, was in part doing. Um, this is more um, going to be part of the emerging story of nation states. So whereas the papacy is part of, when we've talked to before about papacy and, and empire, the Holy Roman Empire, we've talked about how uh, medieval Christians and from antiquity had inherited this idea of government that there should essentially be one universal government, that government that's headed by the Christian emperor, the holy emperor of the Romans. Uh, and then in, on, on the other hand, that there should then emerge that there should also be one head of the church who is the, uh, the Pope. Um, now, what's happened in the Middle Ages though is that as the popes and emperors have more or less wiped each other out, in terms of their power, the empire more or less gets wiped. Uh, the papacy continues, but way less powerful. What's emerged in their wake is extremely powerful nation states, France and England, and now with the union of Castile and Aragon, Spain, uh, as these nation states then are now taking the fore where local kings have increasingly centralized power to themselves. And, and certainly in this case, the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition being a tool of the Spanish royal government is part of that story as opposed to the papacy story. But this portion here, this thing, this idea that in the Monty Python sketch that one of the shorthands here is a fanatical devotion to the Pope should also be a alarm for um, our ears when we're thinking about um, Anglo-American or Canadian here. Um, English historiography whenever we're thinking about anything related to Catholicism uh, and especially even Spain. Uh, there is a whole long period of time in early modern England and also then also Protestant uh, literature where anything related to Catholicism and the papacy and the great enemy of England, you know, with the Spanish Armada and everything like that, this very, uh, uh, Spain, you know, also is always quite demonized. And so this is one of those kind of tags that we're getting out of that. Um, so we always have, when we're dealing with this, this lens of Protestantism, uh, that when we're looking back to this period, especially this period of time when the Protestant Reformation is happening. And so we have all kinds of secular biases that are inherited from Protestantism. So secular people are anti, maybe anti-clerical, which is something that Protestants were too. They're against priests and specifically the papacy and are, it, rather think that the, uh, the relationship with the divine should be more on the individual basis or at least on a congregation and maybe a representative council. So electing councils to represent the church, presbyters and, and that sort of thing. They're against ritual, things like sacraments, against um, experiential practices, things like relics. And then they're, they're also against just all these kinds of physical things and they're more interested in the mental things. So partially what happens in Protestantism is an elimination of sacramental ritual and instead, um, instead of having an altar, we have a table for, on which the Eucharist happens, right? And so it's that sort of, uh, and then the, in the center is the, is the pulpit. <laughs> And so that continues to be the case in the West, the Protestant West. So essentially when we have this kind of thing, there is a, a sense in some ways that our stories are explaining why Protestants are, are right and you guys, the Catholics, are wrong. And so these guys that are dressed up in, as cardinals. So um, I'm going to mention here actually, because I didn't end up making a slide for it and I find it intensely interesting, <laughs> that a, one of the... Um, one of the most ironic uh, components of uh, the Spanish Inquisition story as an English Protestant anti-Catholic narrative um, is, uh, and not only the Inquisition, but anyway, the Spanish story, is that we you know so, so much of the Inquisition is about, as we saw, see in the, um, uh, in the Mel Brooks, there is a, there's an, it's wrapped up with the history of 
Spanish Judaism. But one of the ideas and one of the whole um, uh, um, English labeling and English and German and Protestant uh, labeling of Spanish people as the other is a, um, is, is a kind of an anti-Semitic demonization of just saying Spaniards are all uh, converts from Judaism and Islam. And this is something that Martin Luther actually says quite directly, and he's quite an anti-Semite uh, himself uh, in a lot of uh, Martin Luther's different statements. And so even our idea, let's say, of imperialism and colonialism, when we are telling uh, the age of exploration story here from the basis of Canada, we talk about how um, English people are going to North America for religious freedom and other kinds of wonderful motives like that, whereas the Spaniards are going down to um, uh, the New World, to Mexico and to Peru, specifically because they're really greedy and self-interested and things like that. And so this is in fact an appropriation of uh, the existing Northern European anti-Jewish stereotype and essentially putting it on to the Spaniards and saying essentially the Spaniards are doing that because of their, because they're essentially just greedy Jews <laughs> is essentially the anti-Semitic stereotype. And so this is like another, like a weird layer of irony on our um, uh, Span Ant Spanish Inquisition story. Okay. Over on the right? Yeah. I, it's some cardinal, I'm sorry, I didn't remember who these, who the Protestants are either, <laughs> so I just picked them because they're looking so Protestant. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so, okay. So, okay, so the Spanish Inquisition within its early modern context. So there's no question that this is a terrible chapter in history. So despite the fact that it's told um, in a distorted way, perhaps, because of our English way we, um, we have these lenses, these Protestant lenses, um, nevertheless, we also have to look at it in the terms of what other kinds of things that are going on in Western Europe. So the numbers are really difficult. There are perhaps 100,000, I'm sorry, 150,000 people who are prosecuted in the centuries um, of the Inquisition operating in Spain, of which three to 5,000 are executed. And so this is a big number of people to be put to death. However, one of the things in the same backdrop, we can say that in Northern Europe, especially in, in England and Germany and places like that, during the same period, perhaps 30 to 60,000 people were executed for witchcraft. And so in some senses, this is um, another one of these things where the same um, factors are happening both in, in the Protestant world as in the Catholic world in the West, as Europe is becoming a more and more persecuting society where there is way more and more concern about having everybody within the particular society be uh, labeled as us and you are not us because you are you know, doing some sort of deviant thing so therefore you're a witch. Uh, the Protestants are also burning people for that. So for that second thing, the, the comfy chair and the, and the, the soft cushions and the rack, <laughs> Um, certainly, torture is part of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, however, what um, we often don't you know, think of in terms of the context is that torture was part of all medieval, early modern, and indeed before the, the medieval um, uh, courts had all inherited it from the Roman courts, uh, who in turn were essentially following the practice that everybody had been following for uh, you know, prior to Roman times, which is to say uh, that all the courts used torture. Torture was just something that uh, was had. Um, but the one thing that is happened is that one, one thing that we can say about it is that contemporaries um, at the time of the Spanish Inquisition actually found the royal courts and the royal courts use of torture to be a far worse situation. So for example, um, inquisitors writing to King Philip III of Spain wrote, people sent to the prisons of the king blasphemy, blasphemed and accuse themselves of heresy just to be sent under the inquisitional jurisdiction instead of the king's. So in other words, people finding themselves in a royal prison um, find the conditions there to be so terrible and, and find themselves to be tortured and things like that. Uh, they essentially start saying, oh, I'm, oh, by the way, I'm a heretic, <laughs> and this kind of a thing, or saying things against God or whatever in order, in order to be transferred to inquisitional jurisdiction. So they preferred the inquisition's uh, procedures, let's say, to the king's. So one of the reasons for that is that although all the courts are using torture, 
Um, the, the Inquisition actually has pretty strict rules for how it, it uh, is doing this. And so we saw this when we were looking at the medieval Inquisition before this. Despite the Inquisition's reputation, in some sense the Inquisition in the mid Middle Ages, the medieval Inquisition, was an attempt to actually um, have introduced actual judicial practices, written law, written rules, using um, actual, uh, let's say, you know, these kind of legal and uh, Roman law procedures as opposed to, for example, uh, what regular courts were using, which was things like trial by ordeal, uh, trial by uh, combat, uh, different kinds of judicial practices that had been inherited from the, essentially the Germanic uh, barbarians. And so the church was attempting to suppress things like ordeal, which is to say, um, you would pick up, let's say, to prove that you're innocent or whatever, you pick up like hot irons and hold the hot irons and burn your hands. And then if they kind of um, heal good <laughs> and you don't you know, die from the wounds and things like that, that shows that you, you know, had God on your side and you were right. And same thing with the, we've always seen, we're pretty aware, I think, of the judicial trial of by combat where essentially a person or later their champion, um, they show who who's wins by winning a duel. <laughs> Uh, and so obviously it's a uh, legislation of, un it's supposed to be that God would let the just person win, but in fact it's a um, legalization of might makes right, right? And so anyway, so the idea of the medieval inquisition was to try to have instead things like um, testimony, you know, and swearing oaths and things like that based on um, doing fact finding. And so same thing here. Um, in, the, in terms of the Inquisition's rules, this is the Spanish Inquisition now, the Inqu Spanish Inquisition operates by written rules and there are certain rules like, for example, that torture can only be used when there's already sufficient evidence of culpability. So there's been enough uh, different denunciations that the person who is going to be tortured, um, they can, they, there's a sense that, that the person is already culpable before they can try to extract further uh, confession by torture, and they also have had, had to go through any kind of every other way of trying to convince the person before you start torturing them. I'm not saying the tor I'm not I'm not uh, condoning torture, <laughs> or suggesting that torture works. I'm saying that essentially there everybody is torturing, uh, and that this is an, at least a a, um, a procedure whereby you are limiting its use and trying to make it uh, anyway constraining it by rules. Also, in the the uh, torture. It was very frequently in the king's courts, you know, they're, you're essentially mutilating people permanently, um, even if you don't necessarily even have anything more. You, don't, you can torture without, you know, fairly arbitrarily, right? And in a lot of cases, these kinds of tortures uh, are permanent bod bodily mutilation, like cutting a tongue or doing any number of breaking of different bones that are ultimately end up being permanent. Um, that uh, can't be done according to the Inquisition. They were not to be using torture for mutilation or permanent mutilation. And there were a whole bunch of people that were exempted from it. So you're not supposed to torture the very young or the elderly or women who are pregnant or this sort of thing. So whether or not they always follow all the rules, but these are at least that they have those sorts of rules governing, um, anyway, a practice that is quite horrible. Um, and finally, then here's the Mel Brooks <laughs> number again, <laughs> and the chorus line and the menorah and all of the, <laughs> anyway, all this kind of thing. So. The actual Inquisition has absolutely no jurisdiction over Jews. So this is a um, simplification here um, when he's suggesting that the idea here is to convert the Jews. Um, Inquisition is certainly a terrible part of the history of Judaism in Spain, and we're going to go into a lot of uh, background about what that history is. But the actual court technically only has jurisdiction over people who self-identify as Christian. So essentially the Inquisition can only go after if you go after Christians. If a person gets you know, caught up by the Inquisition and they, um, they, say, you know, they say, are you, you know, anyway, if you ask, are you a Christian? And they say, no. And you say, are you a Jew? And they say, yes. In other words, if you self-identify um, as a Jew or a Muslim, um, the Inquisition has no jurisdiction over uh, that person and essentially has to, um, the, the idea is they're supposed to expel them, but they actually don't even have the capacity to do that. They have to turn them over to a tribunal civic court in the civic court then, um, since the Spanish monarchs have made um, it illegal to be Jewish or Muslim and live in Spain, so essentially deport, you have to be deported. So if you 
say that you are a Jew or a Muslim, that means that you will get deported, but you will get deported under the king's royal law by the civic courts, not by the Inquisition. So the Inquisition is only um, able to, anyway, ferret out what uh, you're after if you identify as Christian. Okay, the complexity of that though is <laughs> that um, when the Inquisition is established, the Spanish Inquisition is established in 1478, um, it, there are a whole bunch of people in Spain um, who maybe self-identify as Christians and the question is to what extent are they Christians and that's the big complexity. So essentially um, as we kind of see the map here of when essentially before 1492 and after 1492 uh, Granada here has been the last uh, surviving Muslim state and in 1492, it, every time I shoot how that happened. <laughs> so last, uh, essentially the last uh, Muslim state is conquered by uh, the Castilians and Isabella, who is queen of Castile, and Ferdinand, who is king of Aragon, merge to ma marry together, and in that personal union, essentially, they create Spain. They um, kick the, uh, you know, they conquer the last uh, Muslim state in Granada. And so then, throughout this whole southern area, though, there have been vast um, Muslim population, right? Because since 700, uh, the <coughs> southern part, the whole of Spain has been under Muslim control and in the, in, the, in the intervening time, lots and lots of Iberian people have converted to Islam and a bunch more have moved in and or, and or, and or left. And of course, throughout that whole time, as we'll talk about it, there have also been a vast Jewish population too. And so essentially um, what has happened um, as of um, 1391, and we'll also go into this in greater detail, uh, when there was a uh, violent, a series of violent mass uh, riots among the Christian populations where the Christians in town after town, city after city, uh, ran into their, find their Jewish populations and massacred thousands and thousands uh, of Jewish people, um, that precipitated um, a mass conversion uh, you know, where people, for their own safety, uh, who were Jewish, 200, some 200,000 um, uh, Jews converted to Christianity. And so then, almost a century later, in 1478, the question is, how Christian are these new Christians, these conversos, these people who are of Jewish descent who have converted? And so, so in that sense, um, the Inquisition is actually um, going after people of Jewish descent, uh, but on the other hand, it's also in part made up of people of Jewish descent, including <laughs> the head inquisitor. So, um, this is a, you know, so this is a complex story in part also because uh, this is the thing we've talked about like that gay people have, which is some of our um, you know, worst enemies are these kind of self-hating gay guys that, don't, you know, that aren't identifying as gay, but who are pastors of evangelical churches who were, anyway, <laughs> Yeah, Roy Combe is another one. Yeah, so anyway, so these are, so in other words, this is another kind of a situation. Um, sometimes when, let's say, if you are one of the, a person of Jewish descent, you're now a new Christian or a converso, and you may have a very elite status in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the society. You may actually be a Spanish nobleman now, and or a bishop, or any number of high positions that conversos were able to be. Uh, under those circumstances, if you have a whole bunch of people, uh, this, these descendants of these 200,000 people who converted, some of whom maybe are secretly being Jewish, or at least their, their, their reputation for that is casting doubts on whether you are truly deserve to be in your position, under those circumstances, um, they are collaborating with the uh, church and to creating the Inquisition to help ferret out the, the situation. So, Shaheen. Yeah, um, I just had a quick comment that uh, a Jewish friend of mine mentioned to me about how there would be groups of Christians whose ancestors had converted and they'd still have these rituals of going into the basement and lighting candles in secret for exactly. the Sabbath. And they're not sure why they do that. Yes. <laughs> I've heard of people in, um, uh, in South America who yeah. do that once a year. They put on a, 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 a sheet and they wail and they yeah. lament and they don't know why. The other thing I thought of was when I was there, um, 
I was told that Spain is known for ham and pork. <laughs> Why is that? Because if you are secretly Jewish or yeah. secretly Muslim, you don't eat it. Yeah, right. And so, like you say, so that was one of the ways of trying to ferret, ferret people out. And indeed, um, and indeed, you know, like so some of the people in the, I mean, there's letters from the members of the Converso, let's say, community who say, we're really good Christians. Uh, they're writing to the Pope. We are super good Christians, but, you know, we just, our, our stomachs can't, you know, haven't been adapted to it to just eat this pork because, you know, we just don't have the enzymes for it or whatever, they don't, you know, however they're describing it. So could we please have a 20 year, um, you know, allowance where we don't have to eat pork for 20 years, you know, and so you want to always get that renewed, you know, or and that kind of a thing. So in other words, that's happening. And so in that same sense, you know, like sort of these customs, like so the people who Elizabeth is describing who are doing, um, let's say, family rituals, which derive from Jewish rituals, that they don't know what they are anymore. In that same sense, this is quite a common story in how Christianity is operating anyway. We're about to learn about this next week with Halloween and the survival of paganism. So just because people are doing, you know, going trick-or-treating, that doesn't mean that they're secretly pagans. <laughs> Um, but it does, they might be, <laughs> you know, I don't know. We, we need the Inquisition to ferret this out for us to find out, you know. Tim, did you? Oh, I was just going to say that. Uh, around the same period was the Renaissance in Italy. So it was the rebirth of some of the classical thought. So especially in the Muslim states, because Aristotle's work wasn't retained in Greece. It was retained more in Muslim yeah. uh, countries and just like the whole Lutheran um, or the humanist perspective of bringing religion back down to the people. So it was a tumultuous time of religious change when people started being able to question the faith because they were able to read it. It wasn't written just in Latin mm. anymore kind of thing. So it kind of it's like proto-Renaissance as well. Yeah, and so actually, we're actually going to get to some of that, and so that's so I, I, that's a good good comment to bring on. Um, okay, so essentially, this is kind of setting up the problem. This is why, um, anyway, where we have this idea of the Inquisition. So, I want to talk about this. Um, I don't know if these are the best icons for it, but this is what I ended up with. <laughs> but um, essentially, that. Um, that like a bigger theme. I think that there is in societies, um, there are two, um, you know, kind of two kind of big competing ideas about how we should have our society. Should we have this mono ethnicity, you know, or, you know, is it okay, or may, or is it to be desired even, you know, for a society to have pluralism? So where where a society could potentially be multi ethnic, where there may be more than one group that doesn't all share all of the same kind of customs, and um, and so in some ways, this idea of like a mono-ethnic society, I think is the simpler one and it's the easier one to kind of grasp and for people to get their heads around. And so in some senses, it appeals to a common sense idea about order. You know, if, they, if everybody is, um, if everybody has all these different views and things like that, you may sort of ask, well, why should they believe that way or why should they be that way um, when couldn't there, wouldn't it be more efficient if everybody were all, you know, one particular way or all the right way uh, and that kind of a thing. And so in this sense, then, everyone in the society in this kind of a, in, uh, an ideal form is the same ethnically, religiously. And ultimately, I think in this sense, in, in kind of again drawing upon like uh, even the Aristotelian worldview of hierarchy, where there's a great chain, you know, of being and rank and everything like that, and, you know, leading up essentially to, um, in a lot of cases, a monarch. And this is definitely um, uh, both true in medieval idea in terms of having a one source like an emperor or a caliph who was in, in charge of the whole polity. But on the other hand, it also is emerging in um, proto-nationalism here in the nation states with a king that's in charge of your national group. So we're all together. This is what it is to be Spanish. Uh, and so uh, being Spanish involves this and this and this. And you are not Spanish. You are something else according to this new kind of view. So I mean, in, in, that, in the sense of that. But I think this is actually also an older view. So in the case of this going all the way back to let's say Iron Age um, uh, uh, 
history, the beginnings of history, the idea of a society like that is more or less your king and your armies are essentially this society, and you then, what you're, you're called upon to do as that king and your armies is to go and attack the kingdoms that aren't you, in other words, the other, and the only real option with them is to either uh, destroy their kingdom and enslave them and bring them all together because the, really the idea is we have to centralize all around one kingdom. Jane. Um, I was just going to make a point that um, when Jane Goodall was doing her initial studies with chimps, this one group of chimps that she was studying, a subgroup of them broke off and started to live as an independent group. And then the members that remained in the original group one day went and attacked and killed all of them. Yeah. So there you it go. goes way back. So yeah, so it's a, it's a, people don't like the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it, it, it goes against your common sense of order, right? And so anyway, so an example here then of this earliest model would be all the little kingdoms leading up to an empire like Assyria, for example, where um, the king of Assyria then defeats all of the local little kings, including up to and including, for example, biblically, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, Samaria, uh, in battle, and that for him illustrates, as far as the Assyrians are concerned, the fact that Ashur, the uh, Henotheist god of Assyria, uh, is more prominent or more powerful or is clearly the best god compared to uh, the northern kingdom of Israel's god Yahweh, who is obviously not as powerful since he let his kingdom get wiped out. I mean, ultimately Marduk ends up wiping Asher, you know, and that kind of thing. So that, and so that kind of is the problem with that theory, you know, in terms of that kind of thing. But anyway, so the destroyed northern kingdom then is, you know, gets destroyed. All of the nobles get carted off. Uh, that's whether you have this idea of the lost ten tribes. They're not lost because they're off living in the North Pole somewhere or something like that. They're lost because they're assimilated then into this kind of model of a mono-ethnic society. They go and the elite go and live. Uh, in Nineveh, in Assyria, and they become Assyrians because that's what the, uh, the model is. My, more complicated, though, is this idea of this multi-ethnic or pluralistic society, uh, but the example of this, this kind of, uh, of emerging after the Assyrians and the Neo-Babylonians and everybody is the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which you know, becomes in the West then larger and more successful than any previous empire in part because uh, the Persians had this imperial policy of tolerance for local religious and legal practices. And so this um, becomes important in biblical Israel and Abrahamic religion because the, uh, the king of kings of Persia um, has a decree that the exiled uh, Jews in Babylon can go home and rebuild the temple because they no longer have to uh, essentially be assimilated into uh, Babylonia. and and that kind of thing, but instead now everybody can have their local religious practices, including uh, Judeans around Jerusalem, as long as then they essentially are paying taxes to the central authority, uh, and essentially the high priest, for example, gets appointed by the, the Persian emperor, etc. Yeah. yeah, I think this shouldn't be confused with the pluralism that we have in Toronto today, because it's, I think the, um, the operative word was local. Uh, most people never went more than like 10 miles, if that, away from home. And still, your neighbors were just like you. Right. The, the other were somewhere else and you never met them. Right, so for most everybody, that's a very good point. So for most everybody, they are not actually experiencing this diversity. They're just being left alone and essentially their leader is having to pay taxes to the multi-ethnic state, right? Um, but the difference will be um, where, so we can show here, um, in this particular picture, <laughs> where, where it, it is still worked into the idea and the, even the propaganda. So here is the tomb of Xerxes, and uh, as supporters on the tomb are guys from every single conquered people who are making up the Persian Empire. So in other words, it's not just everybody's Persian now, because everybody's in their own particular ethnic garb and dress. So Persians, Medeans, Elamites, Parthians, Arians, Bactrians, Sogdians, you know, everybody all the way down to, you know, Babylonians, Assyrians, Arabs, Egyptians, Armenians, Cappadocians, Lydians, Ionians, Saka, Scudrians, Io uh, Ionian with a hat, <laughs> Libyans, and Ethiopians. In other words, so they can, they're, they're really trying to show here that he's king of kings of all of the different peoples. In other words, it's not simply just Assyria has wiped everybody else out because, you know, Asher's the only, only god. And so this kind of 
multi-ethnic empire then is essentially kind of the model for everybody from Rome to empires like Austria-Hungary to the Ottoman Empire, which failed to survive after World War I in the age of nationalism, when national, uh, you know, when this idea that you have to have a nation state just wiped out the remaining um, multi-ethnic empires. And in the same sense, I just want to make the point though, that where um, the place where that whole local thing doesn't necessarily match, so on the one hand, everybody has their own little ethnicity locally, but the place where in these empires there is intermixing is at the court, in the armies, and then in the uh, cities which become increasingly cosmopolitan. And so as the, as the traders are running around, um, you know, we have, Urgen's not here, but his, his, uh, his mother is, or his grandmother was born in uh, Thessalonica, you know, when it was an Ottoman city and uh, when 40% of the population was Jewish and, you know, 40%, you know, were Greek. I mean, there, there were all these different ethnicities. They were not necessarily uh, just Turkish. So, okay. So one of the things though that happens, I put my little emperor on top this time <laughs> of this thing, because it's not, it's not true pluralism. There's, a, um, there's definitely an elite, the Persians, let's say, are an elite group that are on top of all the other ones, or the Romans are the elite group on top of all the other peoples that they've conquered. As time goes on, um, the rest of the empire uh, has there's forces in the empire generally that are assimilative, you know. So essentially, all of the different diversity naturally um, uh, tends to ebb away, you know, in the state over time, and this happens pretty much all the time with these kind of states. And so you kind of move towards that. So that's just a natural trend that happens. And so, for example, in the Roman Empire, that's one of the kind of things that increasingly happened. So, and although it becomes, when it's, when it's founded, a multi-ethnic empire that's created by military conquest, if we look at the western part of the empire at the time of Augustus, when the emperorship uh, begins, uh, local people spoke um, non-Latin Italic languages, Celtic, Greek, Punic, Berber, Basque, all kinds of other languages, Proto-Basque anyway, early one versions of it, and maintained all of their own gods, their own laws and customs and everything like that. Uh, there was then though, Roman identity, Roman citizenship, Roman law, Latin language, which slowly expanded out uh, from the immediate vicinity of, you know, throughout the Western Empire, and especially, actually it's also all along wherever the ar army is. And so a lot of times also what happens is not only the army, which is all speaking uh, Latin and, and uh, is in tune with uh, the Roman identity, uh, also all the veterans. So whenever person, all the veterans are done with their army service, essentially they take some local city and they kick everybody out or whatever, they, they put all the veterans there and make that be a Roman colony. And so now that, that city like, um, Arl um, in, in Gaul becomes a little piece of Rome uh, away from Rome. So over the course then of a few centuries, um, uh, people really became more and more and more Roman and adopted Roman identity. It's Latin in the, in the West and along the frontiers like in Romania today, but in the rest of the East, it, it, uh, it's a Greek identity. It's a bilingual identity in Rome, so it's a little complicated, but most of our, we're mostly looking here at the West, so I'm just gonna think about the Latin part. Essentially, the emperor um, uh, took everybody inside the empire, everybody who's a free man, and give them all Roman citizenship. And so that ceased um, this, this separate status uh, and as a result of, um, anyway, this continual assimilation. assimilation. So it's less and less um, multi-ethnic as people are ceasing as much to consider themselves to, to be uh, Gauls or any other thing that they might be. And now more and more they're considering themselves to be Romans, which is why a place like Romania is called Romania and why, um, uh, well, what we call Turkey, that you know, peninsula was called the Sultanate of Rome or Rome. And it's why the, although we call it the Greek Empire, the Byzantine Empire, they call themselves the Roman Empire, and which is also why the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, was called the Roman Empire. <laughs> you know, because people had adopted that Roman identity, uh, even though they weren't from Rome anymore. So the imperial um, persecutions then of Christians, I would argue, were occur as part of this backdrop of homogenizing identity. So as the empire is becoming more and more deciding, well, we're all Romans inside the frontiers here, and this is what it is to be a Roman, and you Christians, because you aren't sacrificing to the, um, uh, to the spirit of the emperor, to the emperor's, uh, what's it called, aegis, what's the, 
So whatever it is. Anyway, so you're not going you know, to pick up the little thing and, you know, you don't have to do much at all to get out of being um, thrown to the lions, uh, even during the persecutions. But the Christians often wanted to get martyred or at least w didn't want it to make a stand as opposed to, um, uh, anyway, giving in and doing the little thing the Romans would want. But part of that is because the Romans, the pagan Romans, are identifying their society as us and on certain occasional exemptions, uh, you know, for Jews and Christians who are citizens, but sometimes uh, are officially persecuted because they're seeming like they're being kind of other-like. So in that kind of back and forth of whether there's going to be a, um, let's say, a tolerant uh, society and, and not, um, the Romans and the Roman Empire ends in the West uh, with it flipped over to intolerance. <laughs> so in other words, what's written in the final law code is no, not tolerant. So Constantine, when he gets converted, he initially then in 313, upon his conversion, issues an edict of toleration. And so that legalizes Christianity, but it also essentially proclaims religious tolerance for everybody in the empire. But that only lasts a couple generations. So 80 years later, his successor, Christian Emperor Theodosius I, Theodosius the Great, ended that policy and made Nicene Christianity functionally the Roman Empire's state religion. And with that, closed all the pagan temples, uh, ended the Olympics, all of those kind of things that uh, closed the Plato's Academy, all of those kind of things, and began persecuting people who uh, continued to worship the old gods in public, right? So essentially that's when uh, uh, being um, a pagan being a, a heretic uh, gets written into Roman law as saying that means that you're an enemy of the state, you're a traitor to the state, because being a Roman now means uh, in part that you're a good Christian and that you are not a heretic and that, you're, um, that the emperor is the head, essentially, or the, uh, you're part of the same church as the emperor. It looks like there's an error in the data. Yeah. What does it say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're missing a name <laughs> number there, yeah. 379? Yeah, that's 379. So yeah, we, we deleted that there. Sorry for the typo. So, so anti-Semitism, we should note, just to kind of go back and bring the Jews into the story here, predates you know, uh, bigotry against Jews. This is already a feature of pagan Roman Empire, so it's not the Christians that invents anti-Semitism. Uh, the Romans had suppressed a number of Jewish re revolts. Um, and one, of the, one or more of the wars, they actually brought like maybe a third of the entire army to bear uh, in Judea in, in what's a massive war, uh, where they destroy ultimately the city of Jerusalem, its temple first, then the whole city. Uh, and it's ultimately um, rebuilt by the Emperor Hadrian as a uh, pagan Roman city called Aelia Capitolina, from which Jews are banned. So you, nobody can go. Camera? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. This is one of the first cast of thousands, you know, <laughs> movies that they're filming. Uh, the, that's Oops. the kind of biblical, that's, movie. <laughs> that's the kind of epic that they would make in the 60s, because you could always, all the Roman movies are also about Jesus and the Jews, right? <laughs> you know, so anyway, so yeah, um, I think it's, you know, again, these are the spoils out of the temple. And so in addition to the candlestick, it's the, it's possibly something that's being, <coughs> One of the implements. I'm not. I'm not aware of what what they all are, but essentially, maybe the, you know. There's things like the table for the. There's the table for the bread. There's all kinds of different things that are essentially things that are coming from the the sanctuary. And Titus here, who's the Roman general uh, who destroyed the temple, um, has an arch in Rome, which is still celebrating then the destruction of the the temple in Jerusalem. That's a scroll. I think she's asking. I think you're right. This one is a scroll. It's a rolled up. Scroll. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so they, maybe they have a big Torah there. Yeah. Okay. So, that said, um, the Theodosian Code is aimed at pagans and Christian heretics, um, and it's designed to suppress paganism in the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, Christian heresies are also outlawed, and un unluckily for the Manichees, this gets they get included in this. <laughs> 
So it isn't necessarily clear that Manichaeism is in fact a Christian heresy. It's actually a, a separate world religion, probably. <laughs> actually, almost certainly. Uh, but it was one that was too close um, as far as the Christians were concerned. And Augustine, since Augustine had been a, a Manichae before he became a Christian, he wrote a bunch of stuff against the Manichaeans. And so the Christians had a bunch of stuff against it. And so they just brutally suppressed the Manichaeans and Manichaeism also doesn't survive in the West. Um, Judaism, however, continued to be tolerated, and so, for example, um, in the whole kind of excitement about um, uh, these Theodosian codes where he's yeah, closing all of the temples and things like that, and the, um, essentially all of the, the monks and things like that go and they, you know, they, kill, they destroy all the temples. People, this is the era when, when people like St. Martin of Tours are going all around Gaul and uh, cutting down all the Druids' oak trees and they're destroying everything like that, those kind of things, and con forcibly converting everybody from paganism. Um, essentially, they kill, somebody destroys a synagogue and Theodosius says, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. <laughs> so they rebuild the synagogue. Yes, yeah. Valerie. Oh, we have to get the microphone over there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you were saying that um, one of the, uh, a reason where, why uh, Christianity was suppressed was in order to uh, maintain the, the new um, Christian, uh, 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 re yeah, to, to have the Christian religion be the common religion and create cultural, I guess, homogeneity in the Roman Empire. But were there like other negative reasons for the suppression, like perhaps the pagans weren't going quietly, so to speak? Was there like civil strife over it? Oh. I guess, I, I, okay, so I guess there's a couple, yeah, a couple things like you say, there's a, um, so there had been one emperor, you know, uh, Julian, who had uh, attempted to reverse everything. So he was himself, he had been raised as a Christian, but he um, converted to a kind of paganism. And when he became emperor, he tried, did his best to roll the whole thing back. So he tried to um, essentially uh, keep the Edict of Milan idea of tolerance. In other words, we're all on a playing field here, but essentially end all imperial patronage for the, um, uh, the Roman church system. So, so essentially that's what Julian had done. And instead, Julian, if, he had, if he'd had his way, if he'd lived, you know, all of history would have been different. Uh, he ends up getting, um, uh, he ends up dying in a, I think in a war against the against the Persians. But in any event, if he hadn't, if he hadn't, if he'd been able to live a ripe old fifty years or whatever reign, that would have totally changed all of history in the same way that Constantine changed all of history. That said, the paganism that Julian was was working on reemerging would have looked almost identical to Christianity. <laughs> Uh, because what he was actually doing was he created a new kind of uh, church structure, you know, for paganism, which had lacked that. And so that's one of the ways that he, and he, which he patronized there. And so anyway, this was, I think that what's happening in the air is that this is a, a time period maybe in, in history where things are moving kind of in this direction, whether it's going to be a Christian or not. Um, the, the pagans were concerned that uh, as, the, as the empire is becoming more homogenous, the pagans are concerned that Christians aren't, aren't being Roman. And so when the empire becomes mostly Roman Christian, the, the Roman Christians are concerned that the pagans aren't, uh, you know, aren't uh, Roman. And the, um, in addition to the concern, it is also a deeply, um, uh, this kind of era is also a deeply, uh, we want to call it religious, and it's also a superstitious era where, um, where people felt that part of the reason the empire is facing so, many term, so much turmoil and collapse, they're not foreseeing all of the, um, the different economic and other kinds of social issues and factors, but what they are seeing is that the empire is under all of this increasing hardship, barbarians are making it across the frontiers, uh, and so they are, uh, they're, the argument on both sides is, um, because you guys here, you Christians aren't praying to the Roman gods, you know, to Zeus and everybody, um, that they're punishing all of us because you aren't, you are off, you're, you're not on the same page with us. And so likewise, when the Christians are take over, they say, you guys, you pagans are worshiping demons still, you know, because the Christians interpreted all of the pagan gods either as not existing 
or as being demons. And so by being in league with demons, you guys are actually in treason to the, uh, the state and God is gonna punish all of us because of you guys are uh, you know, like this fifth column uh, you know, on board here. And so I think that it's part of, and I'm kind of trying to argue here, you know, as you are going from that original model where you have a, a multi-ethnic state that has, um, you know, that has a, just a general attitude of tolerance under elite, an elite, now we have come to a place where it's more homogenous, and so the natural tendency is to want to have everybody be fulfilling the role that they're supposed to have, I think, in the society. Where were we? Were we here? Okay, here. So, um, okay, so Judaism continues in the Christian Roman Empire then. So there is a the relationship, <laughs> uh, therefore, between Christianity and Judaism that is, uh, at best, it's complicated, <laughs> you know, but it's actually very problematic in so many ways. So Jesus and his disciples were Jews and Christianity had its original origin as a Jewish sect. And um, as Christianity was emerging out of the rest of Judaism, as it, as it separated off and became a separate religion, um, that period of separation caused um, you know, this identity formation where people are saying, uh, well, Jews who aren't Christians are saying, you guys aren't you know, uh, proper Jews anymore and, and you're not allowed to be in the synagogues and the Christians are um, uh, blaming Jews and, and trying, incriminating them for not joining and not under, accepting Jesus as the Messiah and things like that. Unfortunately, um, uh, many uh, stuff, a lot, bunch of stuff about Jews and those attitudes of Jews during that period of conflict are recorded in Christian scriptures of the first century and those uh, sort of anti-Jewish um, uh, sentiments in Christian scripture have terrible long-term consequences for the relationship between the two religions. So although, um, although uh, anyway, Christianity, Judaism is in a different boat than paganism as far as the Christian Roman Empire is concerned, it's, it's, a, it's not, still not a great boat to be in. <laughs> so it's a precarious survival then as the empire now is this unified kind of Christian empire with a Christian emperor on top and, and trying to make it be a, um, a monoculture underneath. All of the other kind of religions like Mithraism, Manichaeism, Gnosticism, Paganism, the Druids, Arianism, Cathars, everybody else, no alternative to Nicene Christianity survived the Middle Ages in the West, in Western Europe, except Judaism. So everybody else got destroyed. <laughs> so Juda Judaism had a real hard ride, you know, so I'm not gonna say that it was, in, it was any part of this was a, um, you know, like a, a, a happy survival in terms of um, it was all, all um, peas and carrots and everything like that or whatever it was all, it was all uh, anything. There was a, but, um, and, I, and even then after the Middle Ages, the ongoing anti-Semitism in, in Europe so pers modern persecution, expulsion, massacres, and obviously um, the systematic murder of Jews in the Holocaust illustrate that there was this very narrow path by which Judaism in general survived and just some of the Jews you know, survived through this entire period, but of which nobody else did, right? So in everybody else, the pressures of creating this kind of society, uh, all the rest of them were eliminated. Um, and I was going to say that part of the reason for that is that Judaism has, uh, and on the part of it is this relationship that Christianity has with Judaism, but part of it is that Judaism has uh, a lot of survival capacity as a diaspora religion. So um, let's just look now at Spain. This is a lot of context. Yes, question. Can, she, can you give him the, it's right here, right behind you. Uh, I, I'm just, uh, why would, uh, Islam not be on that as an alternative to Christian, the prior slide. So, so it so it, Islam is in control of its own states, okay. and so um, so not counting so not you know even in so but even in the Western places that had been Muslim, so uh, parts of France, parts of Italy, all of Sicily, uh, and Spain, um, Islam doesn't survive in the West, you know, uh, it, the Muslims survive in their own, in their own states. Um, there is in Europe Muslims, who, Muslims survive, but in part that's because, uh, you know, so for example in Bosnia and Albania, but in part that's because the, you know, the Ottoman Empire was still alive and kicking up through, you know, into the 20th century, you know, so, and also, I mean, in Europe, in Constantinople, so. Thanks. 
So yeah, we'll talk about Islam in, in the, in, and where Islam is on this. Um, so moving to Spain. <laughs> so this is a lot, of, a lot of context before we even get to Spain here. So you can see why, why anyway, I said that a lot of this is context. So, um, so Jews in, um, I made one more slide here that I missed. Okay, so prior to this, uh, so before we get to uh, this, and we're just going to the um, uh, the beginnings of Judaism in Spain, uh, a slide that I don't have, but anyway, I'll, I'll just mention what it is, is that uh, um, Spain, uh, it's some of the earliest colonies that happened there are from Carthage, and so the, the city on the, the port on the west, Cartagena, uh, is Cartago Noa. <laughs> Right, and so in other words, New Carthage. And so Carthage is in fact a Phoenician colony, and uh, the Phoenicians are a related people to uh, Jews and Israelites. So uh, uh, Phoenician is very similarly related um, language to Israelite. And so, the, um, and so it's quite possible in that early Carthaginian period, I, even in the pre-Roman period, we don't have any evidence really for it, but that's very good, but it's quite possible there were already small Jewish communities uh, in the Carthaginian colonies who went with the Carthaginians to Spain. Uh, we do have, um, though, um, uh, anyway, a lot more notices of, of Judaism in, in the cities and things like that of the Roman Empire uh, in, by the first century and then especially by the third century, uh, Roman Spain, Roman Hispania has a significant Jewish communities. The Jews are, as we've mentioned, Roman citizens. And in Spain especially, they are very well integrated with their pagan neighbors. So um, they are not, uh, let's say, we have some stereotype that Jews only have very particular um, roles like moneylender or anything like that. This is not the case uh, in, the, in the Roman times where people can be merchants, there can be any, any number of jobs, you know, butchers, all this kind of thing. Uh, the collapse of the Roman state then saw F Spain fall to a bunch of different barbarians, the Suevi and everybody else, but ultimately the Visigoths uh, by the fifth century. The Visigoths are Arian heretics, which is to say they're Christians, but they are not in communion with their Catholic subjects in Spain. So the Romans are Nicene Christians, the, um, the Visigoths are Arians. <laughs> We don't have to worry about what that means. <laughs> what it mostly means is that they, uh, they, they have their own identity, which, they, um, which means that they have their own sort of Gothic Christianity, and they, they equally um, like to beat up their Roman subjects who are Christian, Nicene Christians, and Jews. <laughs> and so, both, so the Jews are still initially um, fairly reasonably well off under, under the Visigoths. But this changes markedly when the Visigoths give up Arianism. So the Visigothic kings uh, in 587 uh, convert to Catholicism. So at this point then, um, they were more or less the last holdouts. Their cousins, the Ostrogoths, and then also the Vandals, both got wiped out by the East Roman Empire. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the Franks, uh, who were the other main uh, Germanic competitor, uh, up in France, or what becomes France, are already Catholics. And so at a certain point, the Visigoths are like, okay, we've, we've held out enough. <laughs> and so they, they submit and they, and they join with the rest. When they do, they go kind of all out. <laughs> and they start deciding that they want to now, um, you know, we, they've had this model, again, where we had this kind of multi-ethnic society, Visigoths over top of uh, Nicene Roman Christians and Jews. <laughs> And so now we're going to say, no, we actually all need to all be Visigoths. So we're all going to be Catholic Visigoth Christians in Spain here. And so they preside over a series of church councils that promulgate uh, anti-Jewish legislation that actually becomes increasingly anti-Jewish. Uh, by 613, King Sisebert orders that all Jews in his realm have to convert or be expelled. And as many as 90,000 of them convert, lots more go into exile, um, you know, and others are, are also killed. Uh, and so this is a, a first early period of um, creating a population of um, essentially Visigothic conversos. Yes? I just wanted to remark that ARI Aryans have nothing to do with ARI Aryans. <laughs> ARI Aryans are different from ARY Aryans. We want to make the point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so this Aryans, so we'll make up, yeah, good point. <laughs> So, so good point because we are talking about Judaism. <laughs> so, so, um, so modern Arianism um, in in Nazi ideology 
um, is a modern racist idea that the, um, the Nazis had about uh, Germanic Indo-European races and this kind of thing. Um, this, is, this is like all a post-Darwin thing even. <laughs> So it's a very different universe than what the Visigoths are dealing with. This Arianism here has nothing to do with uh, race or anything like that. The question here is uh, this, this thing that people can never get, a, get their hands around in Christianity is if Jesus is God and the Spirit is God and the Father is God, but we only have one God, how does that work? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, just like, how does that, you know, and so essentially the, the Catholics and Orthodox are Nicene Christians, they've decided that the answer to that is the Trinity, and so uh, and we don't need to explain it, but anyway, that's the answer. The Visigoths' idea is, the answer is God is God and Jesus is some kind of lesser God. So, so in other words, there's one God, and that's God, out of which Jesus is maybe like a divine being, but he's clearly in a lesser category. And so that's how, where the Arians are kind of at, and that's very different from, like you say, Nazi Arianism. Okay, so Anyway, what's ended up happening then is a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of just very, um, you know, it becomes increasingly difficult for what had been a very integrated part of Visigothic society, uh, Jews who are um, economically well off and everything like that, uh, a bunch of them have had to convert. Um, what ends up happening is that, uh, uh, that some of those early conversos are only nominally Christian, in other words, they had to convert because otherwise they'd lose all their property and all that kind of thing. And so they said, sure, we'll convert. But in fact, they continue to practice Jews, Judaism um, in private and that kind of thing. When like the Visigoths had like, there was, there'd be strict kings and then there would be kind of lax kings. You know, when the strict king dies, then some of those people will go back to being openly Jewish and indeed some of the exiles will come back. So anyway, there's a long um, uh, period of time where the Visigothic kings and their church councils are continually legislating with what they consider to be their Jewish problem. <laughs> Um, and in so doing, they're making all kinds of laws and regulations that are, are you know, coming up with all kinds of new punishments and things like that. Let's so say if a, if, if a Christian and a Jew marry and they have a kid, the kid has to be baptized. You know, there was, it's, it's illegal not to baptize them a Christian. If the, the uh, Jews are no longer able to uh, conduct certain economic practices, they can't trade with foreigners, all these kind of things. And so they kind of try to make all these different burdens to make it increasingly difficult to stay as openly Jewish. So what ends up happening then is that the Visigoths totally alienate their Jewish population, which is um, a significant and, in, and economically important part, part of the population. Um, so uh, when then uh, Muslims defeat the Visigoths in battle, uh, so a Muslim conqueror uh, from North Africa, a, a Berber leader, Tariq, of whom, um, uh, you know, so Jibal, you know, when he crosses Jibal uh, Tariq, you know, which is to say the mountain of Tariq becomes Gibraltar. And that's why we call that, that's our English version of the, of, uh, the Arabic. Um, when he conquers then Visigothic Spain in, uh, in conjunction with his Arabic or Arab uh, emir that's over him, um, the Jews, Spanish Jews certainly saw um, the Muslims as liberators. So they're being liberated from this quite horrible policies of the Visigoths. So we get to a place now, you know, where we had been on this whole long trend as we've had, you know, to this monoculture again. Uh, and so now though, when the, when the a tiny fractional population of Muslims is now ruling this, uh, you know, previously Visigothic Roman population, um, we necessarily have created another one of these multi-ethnic societies. Uh, and this is one where the Muslim ruling elite tolerated their Christian and Jewish populations in terms of uh, their religious practice. So now Jews can go and, and practice openly and they are able to do that without any problem. It's no longer illegal. They don't have any of the kind of restrictions that uh, was there in Visigothic law. And likewise, Christians are able to continue to practice uh, their religion, but um, as people of the status people of the book, um, they simply have to pay, uh, you know, the poll tax, the jizya tax. And so essentially um, there is a economic incentive uh, to join uh, Islam, uh, but it isn't, um, it isn't a case in Spain where everybody is forcibly converted and have to join. Lots and lots of people do. There's economic advantages. Uh, lots of the nobles will convert over so that they can keep their, uh, keep their property and status. And that's also true then for all of the locals who maybe 
weren't, they might have been pretty pagan still anyway, <laughs> you know, or anything like that, right? So, um, uh, one of the things that happens um, when Spain is in this period of time, uh, both uh, under Muslim rule and under Christian rule, when Spain has this um, more multi-ethnic society where there's a bunch of pluralism and things like that going on, it actually becomes, it's actually at its height in all of history and it's a success story. And we also saw this when we did our history of Sicily where under the Normans when there is this multi-ethnic society where we have on the one hand Normans and Greeks, Greek Christians and uh, Muslims and Jews in quite big numbers, that that's the moment in all of history when Sicily is really on top of the world and things like that. And it's later when the pressures are exerted where it's again becomes kind of a monoculture uh, of peasants that are essentially um, uh, sending everything to the king that's off in Naples, um, Sicily no longer has the prominence that it had when it was uh, this other society. So Al-Andalus becomes an intellectual, cultural, and economic center at the crossroads of the Islamic and Christian worlds. We have one example here is like uh, the orange orchards, so essentially um, uh, orange groves that the Muslims I think had gotten from China um, um, now are, are introduced. Um, Roman aqueducts and Roman um, uh, agricultural techniques are all about gravity. So Romans really like, they would even make these aqueducts that go really far away and just so that they are constantly just barely going down. The, um, the medieval technology that the Muslims introduce includes all kinds of different things that are like, if you have like a water wheel, you can actually bring, <laughs> You know, you can bring the water back up again, you know, so if you have some of these different uh, things where you don't have to rely on, let's say, you can bring all kinds of um, fields into irrigation that have never before been able to be irrigated under the kind of gravity only system. And so it makes a agricultural flowering, uh, economic flowering, and also intellectual. So scholars like Veroes, Ibn Rushd, uh, who was born in Cordoba in the 12th century, um, just as an example of this, as we're, you were kind of mentioning, uh, Tim, about the Aristotelianism. So because Islam had kept um, and absorbed all of the different uh, Aristotle's texts and things like that that had been lost to the West because um, most people in the West didn't uh, read Greek anymore and so and they didn't have access to any of these. Um, um, essentially, Averroes goes as a, as a medieval Islamic philosopher um, is having to deal with um, uh, taking Aristotle and the different kinds of ways that Aristotle is making logical arguments and saying, well, in light of um, our Abrahamic religion of Islam, we have to reinterpret Aristotle in all these different ways. And in so doing, we have actually reinterpreted and changed Islam substantially um, by, by essentially creating this kind of new theological system that is Aristotelian based. Um, that causes then when, when the wet people in the West through Spain get a hold of these texts, they <coughs> first get a hold of it through uh, the commentaries of scholars like Averroes who they read all of his commentaries first, then they read the Aristotle and they actually read it as, in Latin as a translation from the Arabic, as a translation you know, from the Greek or whatever. It might actually have another step in there from Syriac or something in between. And so as a result, they're kind of getting garbled -y. Aristotle, but they're getting the tools for understanding Aristotle from uh, this flowering of medieval um, Islamic thought. Yes? Uh, one fact about Aristotle is he wasn't actually, he didn't actually belong to the society that he wrote in. He was a medic, so he was one step above a slave. He wasn't a full citizen. Either. Oh, in his society. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so essentially this also then creates for Jews in Spanish history a golden age for Sephardic, for Spanish Judaism. So under this early period of Muslim rule, uh, Jews are essentially able to participate at all levels of society. So for example, um, under a major caliph uh, uh, of Cordoba, essentially the leader of Muslim Spain, uh, his prime minister essentially, uh, Hazda Ibn Shaprut, you know, is essentially a Jewish counselor, so you could be at pretty much at all levels uh, of the society. And like um, Muslim philosophers, like Averroes, the Jewish philosopher Ammonides, just to say Moses ben Maimon was born in Cordoba and was heavily influenced by Aristotle. So essentially, Ammonides is kind of doing the same kind of thing uh, for, Tor for Torah, uh, for Judaism that Averroes is having to do for 
with, with Aristotle for Islam, that, that frankly what ends up happening, that people like, uh, ultimately it's Aquinas, that Thomas Aquinas does for Christianity with Aristotle. So, um, then, well, anyway, then things get bad. <laughs> so we can, we're already very far along, so it's gotta get bad so we can get to the Inquisition. So in the time period that we've talked about, um, you know, before in terms of the Middle Ages, this formation of the persecuting society, this, um, this decision, this rise of the crusader impulse. So as uh, Western Christians um, start going on crusade, when they start having an idea of holy war, when they start thinking especially about Islam as being the other, um, this changes how, uh, how things are in, in the other frontier area, not the Holy Land, not in Syria, but here in Spain. So fighting between Muslim and Christian states in Spain initially isn't really religiously motivated. So even if we go back to very early stuff, um, the, what becomes the national epic El Cid, you know, El Cid is got a very complicated story actually in terms of uh, the, um, you know, whether, you know, it's not just simply a crusade, right? He's essentially a, um, a mercenary who's working for Muslim emirs. He switches sides, he's then fighting on the Christian side. He then kind of is an opportunist and he takes over himself. He takes over a Muslim emirate of Valencia, which is sort of a quasi-Christian kingdom, but essentially he's ruling as a Muslim emir of, of a Muslim state. Likewise, um, in terms of the, another one of these, um, uh, national epics that's read back into Spanish history as if Spain had always been a crusade is the Song of Roland, if you've heard of that. And so this is one of the central and earliest medieval epics, a French epic, and essentially it's, it's making Charlemagne into a crusader. So Charlemagne goes down to, um, uh, to fight the Muslims. <laughs> Uh, in Spain, and when he goes down there, um, uh, he, as he's leaving, he, his troops get, uh, and Roland, his, you know, get uh, attacked by the Muslims, and, and essentially one of the main things that happens in the Song of Roland is they're constantly saying, Roland is dying. <laughs> so Roland gets wounded about halfway through the poem, and then he's dying the whole rest of the poem. <laughs> but, the, but the crazy thing about this, you know, this, this story, in terms of its uh, it's a, as an epic, as a national epic, it's about this new idea that when it's written has emerged, which is crusade of Islam as other, as our great initial founder Charlemagne as crusader. What actually was going on in the, in the actual battle is Christian Basques are the ones that actually um, attacked the baggage train. <laughs> You know, Charlemagne was just down there uh, very opportunistically uh, because a, a Muslim uh, emir who didn't want to uh, essentially uh, kowtow to the, the emir in Cordoba, a local emir, I think in Saragossa, which had been Caesar Augusta, Augusta anyway, in Saragossa, go, went to Charlemagne's court and said, I will, um, if you just, I will be your vassal. <laughs> if I can just continue to be Muslim and you'll be part of my empire. So Charlemagne came down there in order to, in order to have that happen and as he's leaving, um, uh, uh, Christians <laughs> attack his baggage train. Anyway, so it gets reinterpreted as a crusade when it's really anything but. So in this early period, what? He really did go there. Yeah, he did go down there. <laughs> he went down there, but not to fight a crusade. No. <laughs> That's the idea. Now, what I'm just saying is in this early time period, there is way less of, I mean, it's hard for us to, on the other side of, even nationalism, much less on the other side of all the development of crusade and everything else of, on, on a much more developed senses of identity and other, uh, that they simply didn't have that um, you know, in Charlemagne's time. It was completely possible for local elite um, Muslim emirs to go and decide, well, uh, my options here are you know, the, a local leader in Cordoba or some guy across you know, the Pyrenees you know, who I can kind of, you know, get some support from every once in a while, but otherwise he'll leave me alone and I'm effect effectively independent. And that's more or less happening in the early phases of Christian expansion down from the northern mountains into, in what becomes the Reconquista, what becomes a crusade story, it initially is not that way. So over time, as this Reconquista becomes a crusade, um, the attitudes are changing on both sides. And so essentially crusaders from France and other places are attracted into Spain. They are viewing this as a holy war. Now the fighting is becoming between you know, two sides of a frontier line. And when that happens, generally speaking, the people who are actually at the frontier are getting left behind as the ideologues that are from much further away that don't have experience with neighbors get in the driver's seat. And this happens too with the Almohads, uh, uh, who are the Moors, the people from North Africa. When they uh, cross in and conquer 
uh, they come in as, as they're called in essentially as cavalry, you know, essentially the Spanish ha uh, Christians have called in the big guns of, of the French uh, crusaders. So now um, as, they're, as the, uh, they're putting pressure on the remaining Muslim states uh, in Spain and Andalusia, these guys call in reinforcements from at North Africa. The North African Muslims you know, are way less interested in any nice nice for them. This is a holy war as well. So now it really is going to be crusade versus jihad in, in Spain. And so the Almohads, a Berber dynasty from Morocco, they're brought in to send the tide, and then they themselves conquer uh, the remaining Muslim states in southern Spain. So um, when they get here, they are, again, interested in fighting holy war. And so they abolish this dimmy status, this protected status of people from the book, uh, beginning in 1148. And so then the people who are in that territory that's still being ruled over by the Muslims, Al-Andalus, um, the Christians and Jews there have to choose between forced conversion to Islam, death or expulsion. And so Maimonides, for example, uh, and his family, along with thousands of others, they choose exile. And so they, they leave Spain. And so the golden age, you know, at this point has ended uh, down here for Jews in Muslim Spain. Um, meanwhile, <laughs> Uh, something different has happened and kind of unexpected maybe uh, in the northern Spain. So before the crusader impulse really has gotten going, when the Christian kingdoms initially are just moving down and becoming more viable, when they are moving into formerly Muslim territory, they likewise, oh, but look at this, we have accidentally become multicultural states too. <laughs> because they uh, maybe had started out as being all Christian, now they have all these Muslim subjects, and in fact when they actually start taking over cities, they have all these Jewish subjects for the first time. And so now on the model of what they're inheriting, they're essentially just taking over Muslim emirates, and when they do that, um, they essentially now make it so it's not Christians and, and Jews who have to pay the tax, Jews still have to pay, but now Muslims and Jews have to have to pay the tax. And so, and now, if you are a Muslim or a Jew uh, in those uh, different kingdoms that emerge, you now have a special protected status where essentially you are subject directly to the king and are functionally the property of the king. And so um, instead of, let's say, if you're in a town, the municipal government can't actually tax you. It doesn't tax you at all. Instead, all your taxes go straight to the king. And so as a result, you also become kind of identified with the king and, um, and also all the bad things about <laughs> kings and specifically the taxes. And so especially, let's say, in, I think in Leon and Castile, um, as kind of becoming royal officers and being in the royal administration, Jews are often recruited to be the tax collectors. And that's obviously a, a fun association in people's minds always is, you know, oh, those tax collectors, oh, those Jews. So you can see that that's probably not a great association for people in terms of the popularity. So we saw when we've done our lectures on the Crusades about how the Crusades are in this backdrop um, in addition to this identity thing where, where Christians are identifying what it is to be Christendom and uh, anti-Semitism is rising hand in hand. And so we've seen how when people go off on crusade, uh, often they will stop along the way and massacre Jews that are, are nearby, or if they are just regular popular peasants, they will go and attack the Jews because they can't get to the Muslims. Uh, and so all of that kind of thing was happening as a backdrop to the Crusades. We can say though, um, in contrast in Spain, <laughs> Uh, again, there was this idea that in the Spanish kingdoms, if you were subject of the crown, um, there was a special protected status. So for example, in Aragon, the kings made it a capital offense if crusaders on their way to go down and attack the Muslims, let them doing whatever they want to do and that kind of thing. But anyway, this is a idea that uh, where the um, crown anyway had a economic uh, reasons for not wanting to um, anyway have their own uh, Jews and Muslims killed. So one of the other things that's different still in Spain because of this um, Andalusian experience, uh, as opposed to what we maybe think of in Northern Europe where Jews are limited to very particular roles. So they have to be moneylenders or any other tiny number of, um, of jobs that you can do in, uh, in England or France or something like that. In Spain, they're still um, uh, integrated into everything. So there are uh, butchers and there's any other number of different jobs that Jews are able to have, including even being uh, farmers. 
Uh, and they are also, although there are Jewish neighborhoods, there are not ghettos. Those are a, a modern idea. So there's, uh, people are also able to be anywhere. And for example, if a Jew becomes quite wealthy, they can go buy an estate and that kind of thing. And just a point, there were no Jews uh, legally in England until Cromwell. Yeah, well, so there is, in this part of this backdrop it, it is there had been Jews, yeah, they uh, but they threw them out. So one of the things that has happened already before this, as, as this crusader mentality is happening, England is very early to expel all of its Jews, and then northern France, southern France, there's all sorts of those are happening. Actually, we'll have a map, but essentially it's a backdrop that's happening. It's not simply that anti-Semitism exists in Spain, and it's a different story or something like that there. So a huge turning point then in all of this history um, is 1391. So as I say, Jews are directly subject to the crown. And so this caused uh, over time um, then these municipal elites who were in competition with municipal elites of Jewish municipal elites for all kinds of jobs economically. Um, as uh, Europe in the 14th century is um, having all kinds of different economic crises, so there's the Black Death that kills a third of the population and all these kinds of things, um, the Christian urban class uh, develops in this backdrop of increasing anti-Semitism, um, you know, very serious resentment uh, towards Jewish uh, competition and exemptions. And so they are constantly petitioning um, the different Corteses, the different uh, courts of the kings to, uh, to, for anti-Jewish legislation. <laughs> Um, but since they have to keep on doing it, it shows that they don't get the, what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and so that uh, the kings are, again, kind of holding, you know, uh, are, are kind of keeping uh, what is an economic asset to them under their own kind of control. This uh, ends in 1391 um, when uh, king, king kind of dies, and then he has a, king, a, a successor who's in a minority position. And so a... Um, uh, a bunch of anti-Jewish uh, sermons are preached by this guy, Ferran Martinez, who had been the confessor of the queen and who is an archdeacon anyway, and he's going around and essentially stirring up um, popular agitation, uh, all kinds of conspiracies and things about what the Jewish, Jewish people are undermining. This then leads to uh, essentially mobs forming in revolt or where common people then rise up and just start massacring their local Jewish populations. So beginning in Seville, there's some uh, 4,000 Jews that are massacred. And then this just kind of spreads to all of the different towns all across Spain and even into uh, the Balearic Islands and things like that. So thousands more Jews are killed. Yes, the, the Jane. The the Jews were even then mostly in the cities, even though they were allowed to own and <laughs> You can't just hold the microphone that way, you have to talk into it. No. <laughs> oh. yes. So the question even was... You said they were allowed to own property and run the states and be big landowners. Yeah, so the question is, where are the Jews mostly in the cities? So it sounds... Uh, uh, certainly the ones that get massacred are in the cities uh, because they're easy to find. <laughs> and so that's where the big, anyway, the big numbers are. And so, and so one of the things that's happened is that because Jews are able to be at all uh, at levels of society, like you say, they're very prominent in the, in the cities. There are Jews that are in the countryside, but they have therefore less economic they're less competitive economically. If, you're just, if you are just a farmer or in a farming village and things like that, it's nowhere near the kind of threat than if you were a competing merchant or something like that. So they're and so, big landowners. Yeah, and so, and so that, in that sense, they won. And so as a result of that, um, any Jews that are kind of in the countryside, they're the ones that are least affected by this whole thing. So what ends up happening, though, is in 1391, in the urban areas especially, uh, because of this, to escape, um, you know, they have a bunch of different motives, but especially the urgent one is to not get killed uh, by all these mobs, some 200,000 Spanish Jews in 1391 convert to Christianity. And so it's like a majority of the number of Jews total. And so at this point, um, lots of more anyway also don't convert and go into exile. The Jews going to leaving Spain, um, leaving then a small fraction openly practicing. And so the tens of thousands that are then left and that are openly practicing are primarily off in the countryside then where they aren't um, a critical economic component of the society anymore. So essentially what happens here is 
And those last openly practicing Jews then are way more vulnerable to expulsion because the kings no longer need them, right? And so what's, what kind of has happened here is that the economic capacity of the community has now converted and is largely still there, but it are now conversos. So they are now this new ethnic group of new Christians, you know, which is to say people of Jewish descent who are now technically Christians. Valerie, can we get it? There we go. These are the, the ones that left, these are the so-called Sephardic Jews, I do believe. Is that correct? So all of them, all of these would be Sephardic Jews. So yeah. the people who left. And yeah. So the ones that went into exile, um, where mainly did they go? And did they have like a cultural effect in terms of education, you know, in terms of the new learning, you know, that have been such, yeah. you were saying, cultural ferment and advances in education in Spain, be, you know, um, within that community. Did they bring that with them where they went into exile? So um, Ammonides goes to North Africa. I think, does he end up in Egypt? So, I mean, so I think, yeah, so he ends up in Egypt. And so definitely that continues. You know, in other words, people like him are bringing, bringing that, you know, those kind of intellectual achievements, which, I mean, he has an influence then that goes on and on in, in, in Judaism till now. And so... Um, Maimonides. Maimonides. And so, so yes, so the exile community that goes to North Africa, especially other people make it to other, like other European places where there's not uh, persecution, like for example, the Netherlands. And where? Greece. So in Greece. America. Greece, yeah. So in other words, there's all kinds of different places. Under those circumstances, so, so you know, yes, there's going to be continuing, ongoing contributions of um, Jews in Western European thought, you know, uh, thereafter, so. And later, I think, to the Netherlands. Later to the Netherlands, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, one of the things, oh, does somebody have a? Is that also when there was a wait for the microphone? <laughs> was there a very large movement of Jews to Holland at that time? We're we're thinking that maybe the movement to Holland is a little later. So um, definitely, that's one of the places that people go when they're uh, the Jews go when when they're able, uh, because Holland is open to that. So um, so we'll just mention here at the uh, the elite. <laughs> So when you're at the, at the elite of the society, people who had already become maybe, uh, like Maimonides, Aristotelian Jews, <laughs> people who, um, uh, one of the laws that Christians are trying to get passed is that, um, that they would like to have some Jews to wear clothing or some kind of distinguisher. That was one of the things that these municipal elite were trying to get happen because you couldn't actually tell um, because of the integration, who's a Jew and who's a Christian um, prior to this conversion moment. And, and so um, anyway, so as a result of that, when you were already in the elite and you were already fully integrated in the economy, these conversos, these new Christians, are able then to take advantage of their new status as Christians as they step across laterally into the elite of the Christian society. And so, for example, um, um, Paul of Burgos here, who was born Rabbi Solomon Halevi uh, de la Caval Cavaliera, converted in 1391. He took the, takes the name Paul de Santa Maria. He studies theology in Paris. He comes back with a doctorate and is ordained bishop of Burgos. So he's able to have a very, very high status. Other uh, elite landowners, as you were talking about mentioning, they step across and they are, get patents of nobility. So they are able to enter the Spanish nobility and intermarry with the Spanish nobility. So in other words, there's an integration at the highest levels, especially. Um, this, though, left then among the conversos. So when the people laterally move and are much more integrated at the higher levels, at the lower end of the social ladder, new Christians then are an enormous social group and it's somewhat difficult to assimilate. And so um, if you still, let's say, had it, you're kind of in the Jewish neighborhood and you go to the Jewish butcher, that butcher may be a Christian now. <laughs> but they might still be doing exactly the same thing. And so Elizabeth was talking before about things like, you may well still be, well, let's say lighting candles on Friday. You may still be doing all sorts of things in addition to going and attending mass. And so scholars and contemporaries are both quite conflicted about the status of conversos. So everything from whether they are now uh, fully devout Christians who are Christians with Jewish heritage and maybe some social practices or are there a lot of people who they still are Jews and then 
um, and they're simply masking their religion because they have been uh, subjected to forced uh, conversion and violence, and so they're heroes for continuing to maintain you know, their uh, true convictions in, in practice. So one way, either way, um, people are quite you know, divided both contemporaneously, people thought both those things at the time, and scholars argue both those things right now. So, um, however, <laughs> You know, again, we are in this period of time where there's decreasing tolerance for diversity, and so this, all of this was backdrop to Spanish Inquisition, and so that's essentially where, I know that's why we ended up making the lecture context of Spanish Inquisition instead of details of. But essentially, the idea then of the Spanish Inquisition and its foundation, this is after uh, then pretty much the, um, the rest of the thing is over. So it was asked at the beginning of this, was the Inquisition part of the crusading movements to essentially uh, conquer uh, and part of the Holy War? And the answer is no, it's actually instead in the mop-up action, which is to say now that everybody is nominally Christian, the Inquisition's role is in assimilating everybody and making sure that everybody actually is Christian and there's not, let's say, crypto uh, Jewish people or crypto Muslims, in other words, people who are practicing uh, Muslims and Jews who are only pretending to be Christian. It's interesting that uh, you include um, Masons. I read once that uh, at the time Mozart was a Mason. He was a Catholic in good standing. He's living in Vienna. The Emperor was a Mason. <laughs> and while this, this was happening, Masons were being persecuted by the Inquisition in Portugal. Yes. So there's no consistency. Yeah, I mean, it, there's, it's based on the local things. So the, the inquisitions here in, in Spain and Portugal are local institutions that are really only affecting, you know, it, it's actually, we're only considering the, what's going on in Spain. There's also uh, an inquisition that's set up, well, in the Spanish possessions in the New World and the Netherlands and things like that. But anyway, so what's going on here in Spain is specifically um, that, the Span that the inquisition then is also not only prosecuting the conversos, you know, and, de and determining whether they are, you know, in other words, people who identify as Christian, they are part of this group of new Christians who a century earlier um, uh, uh, converted, but who may have, may be continuing to have all sorts of, since they have Jewish ancestry, all sorts of Jewish cultural practices, and or some of them may well be really, um, uh, you know, fervent Jews who are practicing in secret. That's what the Inquisition is actually going after. If they come out and say they're Jewish, then Again, the Inquisition no longer has um, uh, jurisdiction over them. What does the Latin say? Uh, so what does it say? Um, ex exerge domine et judica causam tuum Psalm 73. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, let's see, um, your cause. Uh, I don't know, exerge, it's like, uh, anyway, I, anyway, I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll look it up. I should, have, I should have translated that. So anyway, so anyway, among that though then, then the Inquisition in general is what, they're, what is actually going for here in that same initial picture of that pyramid that I gave is making a monoculture, a monoethnicity within it. And so obviously the, uh, the conversos are the most persecuted within that group as they're trying to be um, uh, brought into line with the old Christians, but also true as uh, crypto-Muslims, also Protestants, in other words, any kind of Christian heretics, people who are general blasphemers are also, you know, getting afoul of the Inquisition, which is to say people who uh, are swearing about God and when they're drunk and that kind of thing, <laughs> you know, uh, and then like you say, Freemasons and then also Sodomites. So essentially, why not throw the Sodomites in? Essentially, the idea of that is, is one of these things that um, when you're in a culture, when you attack up, um, it's like essentially what the, what the Christians here in Spain are asserting is um, that uh, Muslim, Jewish, and even Cathar society, these sophisticated elite others, they have sodomites, but we, as a as a pure people of the of the land and everything like that, we don't have that. These are these kind of urban elite things that um, that are heretic. So therefore, sodomites are are also other and heretic in the same way that let's say, per Iran, you know, doesn't have any gay people right. because it's a decadent part of the West, right? So in other words, in Iran, president of Iran's definition of of the other 
they've got put in there. And so that's also true here in the Inquisition, right? So um, this is just one of the, the map that we've had before, just to show that this is a background of um, expulsion of Jews from all over Europe, right? So it's not only this final expulsion of anybody who is remaining as a openly practicing Jew in 1492, so, um, uh, but also pre prior to that we mentioned in England, in different parts of France, simultaneously then in Germany and all kinds of places all over, all over Europe into the modern period. Um, what was I going to say here? It's interesting they go to the papal spirit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so ultimately then, just to sum this up, <laughs> I feel like that part of this idea is when you're talking about identity and we're defining us, <laughs> us is defined against them. And a lot of cases, the stronger that you're able to make that border between us and them, the stronger the identity of us can be. And so one of the things that happens in Europe by creating these kind of aggressive um, identities, it made, it fueled, a, you know, an, an aggressive state that was ultimately, or states that ultimately became imperialistic and did a lot of uh, world conquering. But they also misses you know, a lot of the actual complexity um, between the diversity of a group, let's say, that's within us, <laughs> frankly, and the one that's with, you know, those without us. Because the them, we tend to uh, demonize as all, even though the reality is that everybody has different, we paint them as if they are all the same. And then there is this tendency to want to make us <laughs> all of the same. And so if you aren't like me, you aren't one of us. <laughs> Uh, and so this is ultimately just one of these, um, I don't know, natural social processes that cause it, that the Inquisition is caught up in that is also um, something that we should always just be aware of as our values. So um, as, um, you know, as we kind of have tried to show, I think here, that part of the whole history of this, um, you know, of this background context is this tension, you know, that exists between wanting to have you know, it's this mono-ethnic uh, society, something that more, got more achieved, not entirely ever, but more achieved by Spain uh, when Spain then went into permanent decline in, in whatever, in the, I mean, not permanent, you could always turn around. <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, in the, uh, after, after everybody, after everybody gets assimilated and everything like that, as opposed to when, uh, in immediately before that, uh, when the Christian kingdom, when it's at its actual absolute height, when there's still uh, variation uh, among the Converso and Morisco populations that are within, uh, within Spain under Christian rule, and before that at this amazing height under Muslim rule of the, the multicultural society. So, there we are. <laughs> The Latin slide is rise up, O Lord, and decide your case. Oh, rise Relating. up, O Lord, and decide your case. And it nice. looked like it said, if you can go back to it, it said Psalm 73, Yeah. yeah which was, I think, originally intended to defend Israelites. Oh, yeah. It said, you know, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now. So now it's quite an irony, right? <laughs> but part of the, you know, so this is wonder, all the wonderful ironies of this relationship between Christians and Jews. So obviously having um, expropriated um, Israelite identity, so Christians have interpreted themselves as the true Israel. And, uh, you know, Christian scriptures have essentially said that um, the Lord can raise up stones and make them children of, uh, of Abraham, which is what's happened with all the Gentiles or whatever, according to the Christian identity, whereas the, um, the people who are the true heirs, you know, are going to be cast aside. Yeah. Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, um, I should remind people that uh, Judaism is a serious theological problem for Christianity, but not vice versa. <laughs> uh, yes. for, for, uh, for Jews, Jesus was another failed Messiah, and of whom there have been quite a few. But for Christians, well, um, the truths of Christianity are self-evident. What's the matter with these people? Uh, and they, they had a phrase in the Middle Ages, um, oh, invincible ignorance, to describe Jews who... <laughs> 
stubbornly refuse to convert. We've seen a lot of invincible ignorance lately, but not of that sort. <laughs> uh, the other thing, I was, I was in Spain a few years ago, and um, you may know that um, Palestinian families some have, sometimes have the key to their old homes. Mm. Those homes may or may not still exist. Jews did that too after 1492. Mm. And some of them still have those keys. And the, the Spanish put out an invitation, if you still got the key, you can come back. Mm -hmm. And eight families did. Wow. Yeah, the Inquisition went to the New World as well. Yeah. Uh, many years ago, I, I was on a day trip to, from um, uh, Cozumel to the mainland. Uh, and our guide was, one of his surnames was Rosado, which means pink. And his English he, name he went by was Pinky. And he said that that name was, uh, Rosado was a, a sign that he had Jewish ancestry, of which he was very proud. The Jews fled to the New World to try to go, what, get away from the Inquisition. Yeah. The Inquisition followed them. The first Jews to New York uh, were Sephardic Jews from Brazil who had oh. fled there and then went to New Amsterdam, which was safe. And in Cordoba, things have changed. I saw somebody had, I photographed this, uh, put a banner in their window. It said, Imagina todo el mundo viviendo la vida en paz. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Mm. <laughs> so. Yeah. So it, I, that's a. I mean, so that's a very interesting coda to the kind of story, which is that um, it's only been a few years ago now that Spain has uh, recognized a right of return for all of the descendants of uh, everybody who, everybody, all the Jews who were kicked out. And so essentially, you're, if you um, can, sh you know, go to a, there's a Jewish institution that does the vetting. That's uh, you know, essentially, this can show that you are one of these descendants. Then. Uh, then the Spain's just like sure, <laughs> so and so that's uh, so some people have gone back and like you say in some cases there's been some property returned although um, not uh, there's some pretty important synagogues that got turned into churches that haven't oh. been given back <laughs> yet you know <laughs> so but anyway some of those still are case, cases are pending hopefully <laughs> so some of them have Jewish services now. Yeah, some of them have been yeah in return but some but anyway there's still some that are that are not been. <laughs> I was uh, wondering if uh, in places like, say, Western Europe, where there weren't a lot of Muslims and they were considered the other, I, I wonder if they used the term Muslim or if they called them Mohammedans and they called their religion yes. Mohammedanism because yeah. of that. Yeah, so they weren't using the word Muslim uh, because, the again, the Christians didn't... Um, so, I mean, the, all of these words that, that you would have had um, in the Middle Ages for... Uh, Muslims are things like you say, Mohammed, you know, Mohammedans and uh, Mohammedians, and they would have uh, Hagarines, so uh, descendants of Hagar. Uh, Saracen is a really common one, and then and then specifically for Spain, Moors. So all of these um, these are kind of words that the medieval Westerners had, and so I've I've kind of cleaned up the. <laughs> The language to create um, Muslims, and then tried to specifically, where possible, to talk about Berbers and and Arabs. So. Yes. Yeah, uh, with reference to the last uh, couple of slides you had on uh, the us, us versus them, um, I'm reminded of um, an experiment I read about. Oh, this is a long time ago, so I don't quite remember the particulars. Um, and possibly in sociology, maybe in social psychology. Uh, with the usual subjects, you know, your hapless undergrads. And uh, th this would be one of these experiments that was run repeatedly so that the uh, findings were robust. Um, the setup of the experiment was something like that uh, it was a situation of uh, social control and possible um, punitiveness with two groups, one which was the controlling group, so uh, uh, these subjects were assigned randomly to either, either of these two groups, yeah. and they had not known each other prior. Yeah. And so the uh, controlling group had the um, possibility of being punitive for lack of performance or whatever on the part of the other group. And unfortunately, typically, the experiment would uh, devolve into 
um, degradation, you know, increasing degradation and even abusiveness by the controlling group of the other, gr uh, the members of the other group, so that you know so they, 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 you know, so they, they would create for them a, um, a kind of a degraded, inferior identity, and then punish not not only because of lack of performance or whatever the you know whatever the criteria was, but also because of of seeing them as not us and yeah. you know less than and whatever. So much so that apparently the experiment had to be stopped in some cases for ethical reasons. Yeah, and it, this seems to be an unfortunate tendency on the part of humans that let's say if there aren't many you know, sort of civilizational controls to prevent this kind of regression into a simple-minded tribalism, it yeah. will tend to happen, even, you know, with fairly educated people like undergrads. Yeah. So that's just an unfortunate thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say, you know, they're, they're kind of like the cream of the crop of the society. They made yeah, it into yeah, university, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. But, you know. Yeah, so this is, this is why, I don't know, this is why I wanted to, in addition to, you know, anyway, highlight this as a theme. <laughs> You know, because this is one of the things that we talk about a fair amount. You know, which is that we that this tends to, this is it tends to be one of these repeating themes that we can pull out of history because um, we see it all kind of, again and again as we're going over the scope of a long history like this, where um, let's say a, 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 there's this tendency towards like a increasing conformity, and as you do that, um, then you also persecute people who aren't conforming, you know, increasingly, right? And trying to expel them and do everything in your power to make that happen. And then you achieve this, it, when, it's, when it's possible, when it all moves in that direction, you can achieve this, um, this monoculture. But one of the reasons why that the monoculture, um, especially if it ends up being having a monarch at the top and being this, you know, like Aristotelian perfection, perfect hierarchy, part of the issue is if you only have the one source that is, um, let's say, providing the insight as the font of all of the ideas and everything like that, and it can only be so creative. You know, the king is only, you might have a boor at the top who, you know, is making, you know, commissioning really bad architecture like Stalin. <laughs> You know what I mean, or something like that. You know, because that just doesn't have any sense of that. Whereas if you have all kinds of competing um, uh, power bases and things like that, there and you, this is why when we've seen before, like so, so city states on the one hand, uh, like in the Renaissance in Italy or any number of other places, uh, the fifth century Greece, when you have all of these city states, you create this instability in terms of military, but because they're all fighting each other. On the other hand, each one of them is competing to create art and all kinds of other kinds of things. And so there's all kinds of flowering that comes out of um, that kind of diversity. Did you say a boar at the top? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boorish Just, guy. As like... you're talking, uh, where I come from, this could be read as U.S. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, the U.S. <laughs> you just were making yeah, me so think of that. Yeah, so now, this as the U.S. has decided that there's a bunch of thems, it's now deciding who was us, right? And so, unfortunately, um, I think that this is—it's definitely something that's happening right now. So there is a reason why, um, uh, in terms of the party that uh, the president of the United States is in, his. Um, something like 96% of the people who voted in the primary identify as white or something like that in, the, in, the, in his party in, a, in an increasingly um, ethnically diverse country. And so there is a, well, there's, that's a component, obviously, you know, so. There's also, I think, is this still working? I can't even tell. Oh. There we go. There's also, I think that if you get used to um, drawing this border and having all of us inside, well, for one thing, it's easier to deal with people who are like you, but it's also more boring. <laughs> but it seems to me you, you, you get used to having us inside and them outside. What happens when you get rid of all the thems? Well, you start looking at us, and some of them are, are actually them. <laughs> yeah. Sure. We will always find somebody to hate, somebody to persecute, somebody to pick on. Yeah. Uh, especially if that has become part of the culture and we're used to doing it and it's a lot of fun. Oh, you were just holding it. I, I thought you had a comment. No, I, I thought you were going to add a <laughs> oh, comment good. onto that Please. from Elizabeth. Um, uh, there was a study that was done years ago where they took a group of school children and divided them up into the blue-eyed ones and oh. the brown-eyed ones. And 
th all they did was separate them and tell them that they were different groups. Yes. And then all this stuff started because the two groups then started to view themselves as better than the other ones. Yeah. Even though initially there weren't any other differences. I read about that. There was a book about it. This teacher just she decided. I think it was about thirty years ago. I think these kids were eight, nine, ten. I forget how old, but quite young. And her first one day, she told them that it had been discovered that blue-eyed people were superior. And you can imagine what happened. The next day, she came and she said, oh, she had made a mistake. In fact, brown-eyed people were superior. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine what happened. And finally, the third day, she told the children that this was all nonsense. It was quite a scandal, yeah. as you may suppose. Well, I would think it would be hard to, get, hard to put the genie back in that bottle yeah. <laughs> once you'd done that. I mean, I think that there's another, I mean, I think there was another story I'm sorry, study done on, uh, on sneeches and whether or not they have stars upon their bellies. Because <laughs> the ones with, yeah, sneeches, because the ones that have stars upon theirs are better than the ones, you know, the star bellied sneeches that don't have <laughs> star well, stars. Like, um, <laughs> this is Dr. Seuss' story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, ab abdominal stars, we cannot abide, abdominal stars are abominable. <laughs> you know, anyway, <laughs> so essentially there's two groups of sneeches, they're exactly the same as each other, except for some of them have stars. And some of them don't. And then when, when the, somebody comes and makes a machine that puts stars onto the bellies of the, the other ones, then all the ones that had originally been the star-bellied ones go and have their stars removed. And so now, because of, they're saying that those are no longer a star. Anyway, it's, it's the same kind of a, a, a meaningless identifier that, anyway, we use. The school children thing is available as a video. The school children oh, thing? Put out by the <laughs> public broadcasting system, WGBH, out of Boston. Wow. You, it's probably on YouTube. Yeah. With cool. the teacher and the original children. Oh. Wow. Well, that's something to all look up. Well, anyway, we've gone really long. Just, just oh. one, one question for John. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure my microphone is working. There you go. Uh, from Melissa Elliott. I believe she's in San Francisco. Okay. Uh, just the last question from okay. the audience. Uh, she wonders whether there's any connection between this keeping the keys of all homes and the idea of priesthood keys getting restored. Um, so I would say no. <laughs> so um, I mean, I, we can talk about. I'm about to talk. Maybe I'll, I'll write maybe an offline comments about priesthood keys and things like that. But I would suggest that this is a um, uh, this is a this is coming out of a biblical illusion that um, anyway within a particular second grade awakening. Um, Protestant, oh, I should be talking to the camera. The <laughs> Protestant um, context, essentially it's reading out of a text out of the Old Testament, out of Isaiah. Isaiah is talking about uh, different kinds of imagery of keys. And um, the reason why Isaiah is talking about it is because keys just barely got invented. And so he's more or less, it's become an interesting idea to talk about it as a, you know, and so as a result of that, it's, it's a biblical metaphor that people are reviving in the second great awakening Protestant America. And so it's not the same as the as the keeping keys to a house. <laughs> Thank so. you. All right, bye-bye, thanks. Thank <laughs>